Thanks so much. So I've been told I have a half an hour to speak, um, and I'm going to break that discussion into three parts. The first part, I just want to describe a little bit about who I am and what I do, what we attempted to do in a series called The Outlaw Ocean, which I think we can start rolling up there in the audio visual room. Von Trapp family. Um, is it rolling? Great, okay, so for the first five minutes, I just want to talk about what I do. Um, and then I just want to recap two stories that ran in the series uh, and just talk about some of the lessons. I'm not a scientist, I'm a journalist, and I've been with the Times for, since 2003. I'm an investigative journalist and I do sort of larger projects. Um, so forgive me uh, that, um, but this is a way to ease into the science, I think. Um, so, as I mentioned, I do long-term projects, and about four and a half years ago, I launched on a project called The Outlaw Ocean, uh, which had a couple of core ambitions, and is there a, okay, th that clock says 10 minutes. I just want to keep track of my time. 10 o'clock, great, okay. So, um, The Outlaw Ocean uh, set out to do a couple things. One was to take our readership out to a space that they often don't go to. Uh, or learn about or hear from, uh, and to ideally do it in a way that was highly narrative, very visual, first person told, so send me out there, get me on those ships, uh, and initially focus on the people that were working above the waterline, so a sort of human rights series uh, that focused on labor abuses, uh, but back its way into the environmental story, uh, so below the waterline. Um, and that was its core ambition. Its second ambition was to broaden the overall understanding of what's happening out there and specifically the bad stuff that's happening out there. When, when I and my editors um, asked people or mentioned that we were gonna look into ocean crime, the reaction was always, oh, so you know, Somali piracy or the BP spill, you know, Captain Phillips or, or um, you know, Black Hawk Down, um, or the two sort of references people had um, of what happens out there. Um, and so having worked at sea before going to the Times, I knew that there was a lot more that was happening out there, and the goal was to sort of broaden that understanding. <clears throat> Whether we achieved it or not, you know, I'll leave to you folks um, if ever you read the series, but um, in the end, or at least in the first stage, the series ran for two years and had 15 pieces uh, from around the world. Uh, we told stories about other types of crime. So intentional dumping at sea of oil and other waste, arms trafficking, human slavery, IUU and over, uh, illegal fishing and overfishing um, were among those. Murder of stowaways, uh, murder in general uh, at sea, um, wage theft, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and then we moved into so the sort of more nuanced issues of the challenges of enforcement, um, and that's one of the stories I'll get to. So that was the overall goal. And these are just random assortment of uh, pictures from the reporting, both during the series, and then I left the paper for two years, um, for the past two years, uh, to do another round of reporting towards a book. Uh, and so these, this is footage from, from those many trips. Um, so the goal was to really sort of prod the public's sense of urgency and awareness of the diversity of bad behavior that was ha happening out there, and also to undergird it with hopefully clear, measured, explanatory um, storytelling so that they could understand why it's happening and to some degree how we're all complicit in it. Um, and also to some degree how some of these things can be fixed. You know, how you solve murder of stowaways is obviously very different than how you deal with arms trafficking or how you deal with IUU. Um, but nonetheless, it all falls under the umbrella of uh, a need for better and more proactive governance at sea. Um, so that's what its goal was. And now I'll launch into the stories and we can pause. I'll tell you when, when it's a shot that makes more sense. Why don't we keep going, but I'll keep looking. My goal to stop here is if, if that runs and I drone on, you guys will stop listening to me and stare at that. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two stories in particular that ran in the original series. Um, one was a look at uh, a problem and an attempted solution as it played out on the high seas, and the other was a look at a problem and attempted solution as it played out in nearshore national waters. 
I'll start with the high seas uh, story because it's the one that um, grabbed the most attention uh, in the series. Um, and it has to do with the ship that a second ago you just saw the back of called the Thunder. So this is one of those stories as a journalist that falls in your lap and it sort of tells itself. You just have to get out of the way. Um, this was a story that came to me by way of a call from a source at Interpol um, who said, who I'd known a long time, former Navy intelligence guy, and uh, had told him on the front end of the reporting, hey, I'm on, on the market for good crime stories anywhere on the planet, um, have a bottomless budget, um, and so if you let me know, uh, I would love to cover it. And he called me and said, hey, have you heard of this thing going down in the Antarctic? Um, there's this chase going on, and I remember he, he said, he described it as, it's the longest not law enforcement nautical, how did he say it? It was more articulate than I'll be, but it was a lo it's the longest law enforcement chase on the high seas in history and law enforcement's not involved. And I remember thinking, I have no idea what that means, but I'm already on board for whatever it is. Um, and essentially, you had this group, you can pause there. Um, it's a decent shot, that's from the Philippines. Um, so you had a situation where a group that many of you probably know about, Sea Shepherd, sort of a, um, a direct action conservation group spinoff from uh, Greenpeace, uh, had decided that it, had, it was frustrated with um, a problem that many people in the conservation community know about, which is the existence of rules but the lack in, of enforcement of them. And this problem that they were tackling, that Sea Shepherd decided to tackle, was the problem of the list, the, purp the Interpol Purple List. Interpol Purple List is a, essentially a most wanted list that you have to work hard to get onto. And at that point, there were six ships globally that were on the Purple List. These are ships that, again, on paper, are supposed to be arrested on site. They've engaged in well-documented crimes of various sorts, again, human slavery, arms trafficking, illegal fishing, what have you, um, you know, bunker theft, um, murder, whatever, and they're on the list, and that list is supposed to alert uh, countries that if that ship comes into port, uh, they should notify the partner government and Interpol, and ideally um, uh, lock that ship up uh, until an investigation can occur. That rarely happens, or happened, uh, with the Purple Listers. And uh, Sea Shepherd and others had been very frustrated by that. It has to do with the sort of lack of any clear enforcement arm of many of the uh, Interpol and UN um, uh, measures that exist out there that are quite strong, but no government willing to act on them. And so Sea Shepherd said, we're gonna prove that you can find these guys, these Purple Listers, and then we're going to, once we find them, wherever they are on the planet, we're gonna chase them and harass them and essentially em uh, embarrass them uh, by drawing a lot of public attention to them and also embarrass the relevant governments uh, that really should uh, um, stop these or board or inspect, arrest these vessels or that have flagged these vessels or that are profiting from the fish coming off these vessels. And the top of that list was a ship called the Thunder. Uh, the Thunder was, an, at that time, a Nigerian flagged, uh, come to find out, a Spanish-owned um, fishing vessel that had, over the prior decade, uh, to the t uh, uh, illegally fished largely in the Southern Ocean uh, to the tune of about $76 million worth of illegal fish, had been spotted year in, year out by various players, um, uh, and had never been stopped. Um, as they had sort of unloaded their ill-gotten gain in various ports around the world and gone as they pleased to a large degree. I'm simplifying, obviously. Um, so Interpol said, let's start with the thunder. Let's find the thunder, figure out where they are, and then let's go trail them. So Sea Shepherd set out with two ships, the Bob Barker and the Sam Scheinman, and found the thunder within two weeks, um, fit nets in the water in uh, the Southern Ocean, and began to chase the, the thunder. Um, that chase turned into this epic affair that lasted 110 days, spanned over 10,000 miles, and ran from the Southern Ocean all the way up to Sao Tome and Principe um, off the coast of Africa, uh, where the ship then uh, sunk. Uh, and the 
almost Shakespearean tale of that chase um, was one that we recounted in the series. I was lucky enough to get on board during it and sort of chronicle the chase from the inside. Um, I'll leave it to you to go read it if you will, keep me employed. But um, uh, I think the lesson that came from that chase, or there are multiple lessons. One was uh, we should all be worried when we have NGOs doing the job of governments. Um, and yet that is, to a large degree, what um, exists on the high seas. There are a lot of great oversight bodies, but when it comes to the most acute crimes, uh, the enforcement mechanisms that exist for capturing these ships that are engaged in these crimes and then actually bringing them to justice are few and far between. In this case, in the case of the Thunder, partly credit, and Sea Separate is a controversial group and, and I, I'd be the first to say there are lots of problems with it and what it does in general. But in this case, in this campaign, uh, it's hard to deny that it was a success. Um, its goal was, as different from other campaigns, not to actively break any laws, Sue Shepard, um, in, its, in its direct action. So not ram as it does, ram the ships as it does with some whaling ships or, or obstruct its path, but rather to just shadow it and uh, apply public pressure through media you know, essentially. Uh, and indeed, that's what happened. A lot of eyeballs fell on the thunder. Uh, ultimately, it was arrested. Uh, the the uh, officers of the ship were arrested, incarcerated in South Tome, prosecuted, heavy fines were issued, the crew was sent home. Uh, and it brought a lot of attention to a really uh, deep problem. At the same time, so that's a success. At the same time, uh, it doesn't seem to be in any of our interests in the public to rely on NGOs to do this kind of work because you can all intuit the real risk if something were to have gone wrong uh, and also the clear lack of oversight that the public can exert on private players uh, essentially acting as vigilantes. Um, so that's one lesson I took, at least, from that story. Another lesson was the importance of collaboration. So Sea Shepherd has long been an organization that did not um, work with fishing companies or governments or even Interpol. And this campaign was different. <clears throat> it did all that. Uh, and it quietly worked with the Australian Navy. Um, it publicly and quietly worked with uh, a major Australian fishing company in both cases to gather intel so as to find the Thunder and the five other purple list listed vessels that they found. Um, it subsequently quietly worked with Interpol and several governments, the British government included, uh, to investigate and prosecute those officers. Um, and so this would not, it worked with the media, it worked with lots of folks. Um, and so this would not have been a success story were there not uh, collaboration. Uh, and I think that's um, the only, you know, it's a pretty, Pollyanna point to make, but um, it's a very important one when it comes to enforcement concerns on the high seas. Um, I had a third point, and let me. Oh yeah, IUU can be stopped. You know, for a long time there was this rhetoric that, um, well, it's just it's a vast space and it's impossible to find these guys, and um, you know, kind of, we as governments uh, can't possibly. Uh, you know, locate the needle on the haystack that are these ships engaged in this behavior. And yet it took, you know, Sea Shepherd two weeks to find the thunder in Antarctic waters. So um, uh, that, I think, really blew a hole. And again, the five other uh, vessels that they ultimately found. So I think that really blew a hole in the whole notion that it can't be done. Um, so let's move to Palau, doing okay on time. Um, so a separate story, and you can roll that uh, video again uh, for a little while. Um, so a next, the last story in the series that ran in the paper was a story that ran in the magazine, and this was a story of a very different sort in the sense that it moved its focus from the high seas. Again, it's an enforcement story, which is an odd fit for this room because I know it's mostly scientists, but what you do, I think, is super essential for enforcement to have the right targets. Um, so uh, 
This story shifted its focus from high seas to national waters and shifted its focus from NGOs to governments and sought to look at one country in particular, that of Palau. So Palau, like Indonesia and a handful of countries, had sort of decided to cut a different path as a government uh, and really take a aggressive and proactive stand on protecting its waters. And uh, Tommy Romanesco, the president at the time, still, I think, um, uh, you know, um, was very committed uh, to, um, from the bottom up, building policy, uh, build policy toward uh, protecting their waters. Some of that was principle. Some of that was self-interest. You know, 50%, a little over 50% of uh, the country's um, GDP comes from tourism, and specifically marine tourism, and largely shark um, and coral reef tourism. Um, and um, uh, the country was looking down the road and seeing that um, that portion of its livelihood was rapidly uh, falling ill and disappearing uh, in part from uh, an onslaught of, and a long running onslaught of illegal uh, fishing in its waters. So on the books, uh, Palau had done a lot of really aggressive things, created huge MPA, written good policy on shark protection, some good policy on tourism control, um, et cetera, et cetera. You know, sort of a quota system on its uh, nearshore fishing vessels, licensing improvements on its tuna vessels in particular. Um, but at the end of the day, Palau is a tiny country, not super wealthy. Uh, you know, think of Palau, archipelago nation, landmass the size of Philly, Philadelphia, excuse me, I forget, I'm not. Um, uh, and sea space the size of France. And Palau had, at that time, when I was there, one ship called the Remelik, first president of Palau, and 17 guys as their patrol force. So you do the math on what that looks like as a patrol car if you're a cop, you know, basically responsible for France. Um, and not very great infrastructure in terms of technology at that point. Uh, and so for me, I was attracted, obviously, this is a great David and Goliath story, um, or is it a myth of Sisyphus story? Um, I wasn't sure going in, um, but it's a great epic story of this tiny nation that's trying to protect its waters. Uh, and it's in a rough neighborhood. It's got you know, a lot of, if you look at the map, which I don't have up, that's actually from Palau, um, shark fins. Uh, so we can, well, we'll keep going. I forgot that I was running. So, um, so I went to Palau to embed on the Ramalek and watch these guys and this force and see what they were up against. You can stop right there um, on that one. That's Haiti. Um, so what did I see? I saw a depressing reality um, of how difficult enforcement is for governments, even just near shore, not high seas. Um, and so to talk about that difficulty, I'll start with two sort of sub-stories. One is uh, in 2012. Let me, I wrote down, it's been a while since I wrote these stories, so I needed to. Um, so 2012, the debacle. Um, so in 2012, the Remelik got a call that there had been repeat visits from a poacher fleet, a Chinese poacher fleet. It consisted of a mothership and several smaller vessels. And it was spotted by a ranger, of which there were three on this one eastern side of the island of the archipelago chain. Um, and they have an outboard motor boat. They can't do anything about it. So they call it in. They say, you know, third day in a row, we're seeing this, these guys out there. You know, we need some backup here. So the Ramalik dispatches. It goes to that portion of the island. It tries to stay under the cover of night, hidden in a spot where they think they'll see them if the guys come back. The guys come back. Uh, a chase ensues. It doesn't go well. Uh, the Palauan officers as is often the case, the, the Chinese vessels run and try to make it to the 
the border, essentially. They're headed into, uh, you know, out of Palau's waters, where Palau's jurisdiction will end. Uh, so they make a run for it. The Remelik, you know, does all the standard protocol for trying to get them to stop. They don't stop. The, the officers open fire on the Chinese vessels. The Palauans say they were trying to take out the engine. The Chinese say they were trying to kill the guys. The Palauans, sh a bullet ricochets off of the engines, hits one of the deckhands, and kills him. Uh, the ship stops. The other ships have dispersed. The Palauan officers board the vessel, begin triaging the guy, arresting the other guys, to figure out where the other boats went. Meanwhile, back in the capital, uh, the Palauan government scrambles a Cessna. There's an American guy who lives on the island. He's an interesting character. Read my book. Um, uh, and he, he's on contract with the government. He jumps in the plane, takes two Palauan officers. The Palauans don't have their own plane, so they use this guy. They head out in a Cessna to go look for the mothership, which is making a run for it. Night falls. The first ship is locked down, they get the guys off, they're looking for the mothership. The Cessna gets lost and is never to be heard from again. Well, not so true. They hear, it's very tragic, they can hear the Cessna. The Cessna can't hear the tower. So they heard the whole debacle in slow motion unfold via the radio as the Cessna got more and more lost, but they couldn't communicate with it. And then the Cessna eventually says, we're gonna, we're, we're running out of, we've run out of fuel, we're gonna land on the water, we don't know where we are, and that's the last we heard of them. So they're assumed dead. Two officers and the pilot. Very bad day for Palau. Um, the Chinese government is livid, uh, begins this whole diplomatic row. Um, okay, so that's 2012. And that, to me, is this reckoning moment when Palau realizes they need some help to patrol their waters. Okay, now jump to 2015. Different scene altogether. Uh, another Chinese poacher vessel, this one called the Xin G233, uh, spotted in the waters. Phone rings in Palau. It's a guy named Bjorn Bergman who worked then for an organization in West Virginia called Sky Truth that monitors AIS and satellite transmissions and was partnering with the Palauan government to help keep eyes on the water. Some folks in the, head, in the um, capital of Palau and Karor uh, from the Australian neighbor, uh, Navy who are embedded there to help with the Palauans and from Pew, an organization in the US, are there, they get the call, and they begin this whole mission. Bottom line, it's a textbook success. An amazing collaboration between the British government, the Australian Navy, the US government, this NGO in West Virginia called Sky Truth, uh, and the Palauans, uh, obviously running the show. They arrest the ship, they bring it back to shore, no injuries, it's amazing. It's what it should look like. It's what it probably will have to look like for these small island nations. Um, a lot of deep, deep pocketed help from wealthier nations and NGOs. All right, so what's the lesson of that? I always go pessimistic. Um, so great, it's, you know, it's a success story. But truth be told, um, the real hard part began then. So they brought the ship back, they have 33 crew, and now they have to do what happens next, and that's sort of unwritten. Um, I mean, they'd done some prosecutions before, but this was a great example of just how difficult it is. Where do you put those guys? You have to make sure that you treat them properly, or else you're gonna get hit with human rights you know, violation allegations. That's expensive to put them up. You have to bring a doctor on board. You have to house them. Where do you put their ship? Do you have law on the books that allows you to prosecute them? So for example, thanks to Sky Truth and Catapult and some other satellite players, they had really good imagery proving that these guys were fishing illegally. But the laws on the book, the Chinese, the, the company behind the ship lawyered up, really strong lawyer came in and said, wait a minute, so what's your evidence? That satellite imagery is not actually legal as evidence on a prosecution in the way you have your laws written. Big problem. So now the Plowing government is running up a huge tab on having had this success story 
of having prosecuted, of having captured these guys, but it's turning into a debacle on land um, and an expensive one. Uh, do you have translators that can handle all the crew? What's your repatriation policy? Who are you going to prosecute? The crew often are trafficked, and they're just following orders. So the officers, but sometimes, so the officers are the ones you're going to target, but sometimes it's not easy to tell who's who. Um, so all these very unsexy logistical questions um, come into play, and I bring them up because I guess I would say, and maybe this is the wrong audience for it, because you guys are, I think, a bunch of scientists, but I do think that ensuring that the science is plugged into a couple of things, maybe this is my rounding up point. Number one, the science, as I think Sea Shepherd taught us, um, the sense of urgency and the, the, the nature of the problems out there um, have to be framed in a way that the public at large understands and cares about. So science for its own sake is not sufficient, so says a former academic, now journalist. Um, uh, and so always thinking about how to make that research speak to the public I think is super important. And then also thinking about the downstream logistics from an enforcement perspective of how that science uh, or other type of research plays into the what happens next stage of, so if we succeed and we set an, up an NPA, how are we going to police it? And then even in the policing scenario, what happens after we get the guys? Those questions I think are extremely essential uh, for everyone in the room to bear in mind as you're doing your research. Thank you.